The Introvert's Edge podcast was designed to create a dialogue around introversion, to stimulate a discussion around our disadvantages, how we overcome those disadvantages, and what we consider our introvert's edge. Together, we're finally going to confront the stigma around introversion, showing that we're not second-class citizens. We're just different, and we need to embrace that. Hello everyone and welcome back to another episode of The Introvert's Edge. Today I'm excited to introduce Jay Papazan. People will probably know him as the co-author of the massive success book, The One Thing. Jay, welcome to the show. Thanks so much for having me. I'm really pleased to be here. I'm super excited about having you on the show. I mean. Firstly, I mean, look at the view that you've got in the background. I was saying, so I, I do some work with uh, with your team and Don Hobbs and, and the team over the Maps Business Training. And I, I was I was joking with you beforehand about every time he took me to a different boardroom and I got a different amazing view of the Austin Greenbelt. Yeah, we've got about three sides with some really nice green on them. The other one, the fourth side is Mopac Boulevard, which is not nearly so pretty. But I, got, I lucked out. <laughs> My current office has a good view. Yeah, well, you want to keep those uh, those best-selling books happening, then, don't you? Well, I keep it behind me so I can keep writing. Well, that that's exactly it. I actually, it's it's funny. I I lived in a, an apartment in Melbourne that had a view of the entire city, but there's nothing like the creative vibe that you get when you're writing around nature. And I think Austin has that unique ability to to really have that, where you're kind of only a few minutes from town, but you still have that beautiful nature behind you at all, or in front of you the whole time, which is just fantastic. I was very surprised when I moved to Austin. I didn't realize how many trees and how green it would be. You think of Texas, you think about tumbling weeds and canyons, and it's a it's a unique little island in the middle of the state for that. And I I love it. I like the water. I like the trees. <laughs> Well, we'll let you stay then, mate. I mean, as, as an Australian, I have to say that, you know, Austin's one of those places, like I've traveled to so many countries around the world, so many different cities, and Austin is the only place outside my hometown where I've, I've, I've landed and gone, oh, thank Christ, I'm home. And uh, it's, it's just such an unbelievable city. There's so much culture and, you know, I, I just love it here. But enough, enough about Austin and, and let's get into you. I mean, your story is, is really, really interesting. And I, I'm sure nobody believes that you're an introvert. I mean, you, you've come from real estate sales and, you, you know, you're a co-author of a best-selling book and you speak everywhere. I, I really want to hear about your story about, you know, where you came from and some of the barriers you had and how introversion kind of played with that to, to get you where you are today. You know, I've always been like a bookish, quiet kid. I mean, that was it. I mean, you I played by myself. I have memories of playing by myself on the stairs in our split-level home just for hours on end. So I had a big imagination. I loved to read books, and eventually I loved to write. Um, that happened much later. So introversion is no barrier to writing. It actually works for you, right? Go get in a cave yeah. and produce your work. I'm not distracted by people. I can be very task-oriented. That's all good. Um, the challenge comes that if you want to have a book that sells, and that means you have to step out of your comfort zone. So there's a lot of different little veins that I could go through here. But um, first, I'll correct. I'm not a real estate salesperson. I work in the real estate industry. My wife runs our real estate team. And one of the big ahas I've had as I've kind of grown up in business is that introversion isn't a barrier to achieving anything. It just sometimes means you have to succeed through someone else or succeed a different way. So we own multiple businesses now, and obviously we've sold close to 3 million books between all the books that we've written. And so I, I'll go to the moment of truth for me. i had been happily in the background, always in the background, and our writing partner, Dave Jinks, retired. And every year we did kind of a state of the union at our company meeting. And it would be Dave Jinks and Gary Keller on stage in front of like 8,000 people. And I would help them prepare for weeks. You know, I'm the, you know, the writer on the team and I like getting into the facts. And when he retired, Gary said, you know what, I'm going to do it alone. Well, Sunday morning, I'm in Orlando, Florida. It's probably like 2009, 2010, somewhere around there. Um, I get a phone call in my hotel room at 5.45. I'm like, this can't be good. And it's <laughs> Gary's assistant saying, Gary's decided he wants you on stage today at 9 a.m. Oh, wow. So the heart rate started. To <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, thank goodness I hadn't had breakfast yet, right? I mean, complete and utter panic. And worse, I had to give a presentation already. 
like at 730 that morning. So I already had a small group presentation, which I was only modestly comfortable with to begin with. So I couldn't even spend all that time preparing. So I ended up going um, with very little preparation, very little time to panic, which was a good thing. And I walked on stage in front of about 8,000 people. And I'd never 8, experienced 8, people. <laughs> 8,000 people. It's a huge auditorium, right, at the, the Orlando Convention Center. And the lights are on, and all you can feel is this dark cavern that you know is full of people. And I don't know that I've been that afraid ever. Um, yeah. But I kind of put a brave face on it, and I knew that it was just a matter of about 90 minutes. That's how long we were up there. And I learned some lessons. Like, I didn't know. I didn't have a head earpiece in. So every time Gary talked and he wasn't facing me, his voice would go all the way to the back of the room and then come back. So I would hear this garbled echo. So like he would turn to me with a question. And I had no idea what he said. This is like the stuff of like, you know, walking on stage naked nightmares, right? But yeah. somehow I just kind of muddled through, you know, I just kind of imp improvised. And at the end of that period of time, we walked off stage and I was utterly emotionally exhausted. And I turned to Gary and he's my partner and my mentor. I look up to him and I was angry. And I said, please don't ever do that to me again. And he said, I just can't promise you that. And I'm like, what do you mean? He goes, you say you want to be a best-selling author. Well, what do best-selling authors do? They do what you just did. So you need to get comfortable being uncomfortable. And that's advice coming from, from Gary Keller, who's an introvert himself. Yeah, he's a very <laughs> determined introvert, right? So he will do what's necessary, um, even if he doesn't enjoy it. He's one of those driven people. And so I looked up, and this is an example. I don't think I would have done this in my younger years, but we were already kind of laying the groundwork for the one thing, and I kind of understood success the way Gary did. I made a commitment that I would teach at least once a month for the following year. It didn't wow. matter if I went into a local office, if I ta taught our staff here. I just kept raising my hand, and I was like, if I don't get past this between now and next year, there's no way I'll survive it. So that was the, the, the process of really trying to desensitize yourself to the fact that you were speaking to people. Because he told me the truth, right? It, it really is helpful if you want to write a best-selling book to feel comfortable in front of a large body of people. And yeah. so I got so much advice that year. I mean, one of the biggest things, I, I, two things I carried away. Um, I now know that if I prepare for four hours for every hour I'm on stage, most of my fear goes away. So right. that sense of anxiety. So my stage fright mostly. So it's four hours for every hour, and I still do that. And the other one is if you think about introverts, right? There's a, we used to use the DISC behavioral profile, right? Um, and it just broke people into four groups instead of the big broad buckets of extrovert and introvert. But there's a group called high S's and essentially they're the people who are super supportive. They're very warm. And I got to where I could identify them in any crowd because I would go out and it was John Davis who told me to do this. He goes, um, it's our current CEO. He said, Jay, divide the audience into three quadrants. So you talk to all parts of the room and find those people and you'll know them because they'll be sitting up straight. They're going to be nodding their head at you and smiling because yeah. they're more afraid of your failure than you are. Like they're going to feel it with you. So they're sending all the energy back. And I do that to this day. I'll find, because there's everybody else is on their phone. You know, you can have this inner dialogue, but I just talked to like three people in the room. And so just a couple of strategies. One, you know, I, I jumped out there and just committed to, to desynthesizing a preparation strategy so I wouldn't sabotage myself. And then kind of a psychological strategy so that when I'm actually up there, I'm talking to the minority in the room that are 100% engaged. So I think that year was the year I discovered, at least around that area, that just three things, you know, being a little purposeful, three different ways of approaching things, I could really achieve something I didn't think was possible for me. And now I've, you know, I've walked in front of, I think the biggest crowd I've been in front of is close to 20,000 now. And it took a lot of energy, like I was exhausted afterwards, but I wasn't just in, in a state beforehand. I think that's amazing advice, Jay, because I, th I think from, from myself personally, when I was learning to speak, I mean, 
the, the three people idea that you were just talking about, that was everything for me. I mean, I've had Jamie Masters and Ryan Dice talk about their public speaking and they like to imagine nobody's there. And you know, that works for some people because what works for some introverts doesn't work for others. For me, I need the validation that people are enjoying it and I take that from those three people. So for me, I draw my energy, I think my nerves went away when it was Jim Cathcart, uh, who's an amazing speaker, that just shared with me, just focus on those three people and everything will change. And for me, it, it really did. And I think it's so valuable what you've shared about the fact that it's strategy that makes you successful on the stage, as opposed to just having that, that buoyant personality. What I would like to go back to though, is in regards to, you kind of talked about four hours for every hour that you spend on the stage. When you're doing your preparation, what goes into that process? You know, I don't rehearse out loud. I feel very uncomfortable doing that. I don't, you know, I know some people that's their thing. I literally will print out my slides in note format. And I, some of these I've done many, many times, but I will mentally start a clock and just start going through in my head what I would be saying. And I just kind of go through it. I, you know, rehearse the facts. If there's a story, I might take notes. And if I've done that, you know, for an hour speech, I've gone through that four times. By the fourth time, I'm barely looking at the notes. I just kind of know that about myself. So I'll do it on the plane. I'll do it literally sometimes. I'll be still doing it right before I go on stage because it just, I'm doing something instead of just sitting there being nervous. I'm with you. Preparation is the key to reducing that stress and anxiety around it. But I think also the act of preparing, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm not sure if you've ever been to one of those Anthony Robbins events where you walk across the hot coals, but it's one of those things that a lot of people do. And he teaches you how to, when you're about to walk over the fire, you start saying this chant, cool moss, cool moss, cool moss, which means nothing. But what it does is it switches that internal monologue off of, oh gosh, I'm about to walk on hot coals or I'm about to go in front of thousands and thousands of people. I'm really interested to hear though, like you've spoken in front of some amazing, well, huge size audiences. Tell me about the mindset now when you go up. Do you just bounce on the stage now? Are you comfortable or are you, you, do you still get terrified every time you go on? Um, I always get nervous. Um, I'm preparing for filming tomorrow. And after we get off this call, I've blocked a huge part of time just to prepare for that. Because I don't want to be nervous. So I treat it like a game. Um, I enjoy teaching. I don't get any validation from the spotlight. Um, that doesn't do anything for me. Um, I don't, th there's a lot of what people like about the stage that doesn't do anything for me. It actually takes. But I want to know that my mission was to communicate, you know, three ideas. I really wanted to bring value. And when I go off the stage, invariably, you get to meet some of those people. And if I hear that they got those things, then to me, I'm like, touchdown, good to go. I'll go on to the next one. So I view it as a task, right? And, you know, an event, like I, I've got this, I have my goals, and I want to make sure I achieve them. And I'll confess, and maybe you do this too, those three people, sometimes four, depending on the shape of the room, if I get a chance, I often will go up to them and thank them personally and say, I don't know if you know this, but Matthew, I was talking to you about a third of the time. And they'll laugh. They'll go, I thought you were looking at me. And it's just that moment. And it's just like, thank you, because you were like my center in this whole part of the room. I 100% do that. Actually, but even before I knew the three things, I, I used to focus on just one person and think that I was having one conversation, which made me a very one-dimensional speaker because I wasn't speaking to the whole stage, but I was still learning. And that's actually how I met Jim Cathcart. Jim Cathcart was that person standing in the front of the stage giving me my energy. And his advice to me afterwards was, don't just do it to one person, just pick three. And I still to this day, yeah, I, I go and thank those people because they may not be the person I may get as a client, but they were the person that made sure I could deliver to everybody in that room. So I totally get it. And as an introvert, I think for me, I'm not sure about you, but I need to come from a point of authenticity. So I need to believe that I'm sharing value with people, not just sharing it to an abyss. When you go and deliver your presentations, I'm interested when you say you want to get through three concepts, do you have a format that you follow? You, do you go through a, like a lecture style, a dot point style, a story style? What, how do you share your message with the world? You know, I think that the rule of three has been around forever. Like, you know, back to my journalism classes, people tend to remember threes very well. Um, I, we almost always build models in all of our books. So I will usually identify what's the core thing I want them to walk away knowing. 
and usually a couple of supporting ideas. And those might have five steps in them, but I know that like for the one thing, the book, like a lot of times I want them to understand how positive habits are formed, why it's important, and then how to do it. That would be a classic speech. And then I drop in the slides and the talking points that I think would make that work for that audience. But I try to keep it simple because if it's a lot of stuff going on in my head, um, then I get nervous. I need even more time to prepare. I, I think that's really valuable. And I agree with you. I, I talk about three concepts. I think if you go more than three concepts, people get overwhelmed with the amount of information. And if you go less, you're kind of stretching yourself out too much. So I, I agree. Three steps is exactly the right format for, for doing this. I, I, I guess one of the other questions that I have just before we transition is when I went and learned to be a speaker, what I found was there were a lot of extroverts that had lots of advice for me. And some of that worked for me, a lot of it didn't. So I, I really like to hear your path of, you know, how you got help, how you mastered the art. What was the trajectory and what didn't work for you? Well, for, I'll be the first to say, I know I haven't mastered it. You know, I think that I am on the path and I'm committed to being the best I can be. Um, and, you know, with all the limitations that come with my behavioral profile, right? And I'm cool with that. But you're right. And it's sometimes a little bit annoying, especially in the beginning when people would say, just relax, have fun. I'm like, what are you talking about? This is torture, <laughs> you know? It's fun for you because of who you are. Um, so I, I definitely got that advice, but one of the things that extroverts have helped me, like Jeff Woods, my partner on The One Thing, he does The One Thing podcast. He's a natural extrovert. He'll always remind me, bring your energy up, Jay. You know, you can be very intellectual, you can be very inward energy, and the thing about being on the stage and the bigger the stage, that's why like in theater, they have all that makeup on. You kind of have to exaggerate everything. And so that's nothing that an introvert would have told me to do because it wouldn't be natural for them either. So I do try to ask the question, what can I take from them that I can apply? And what does that look like for me? Like, I'm not going to go out and start telling stand-up comedy. You know, I'm not going to do that. Yeah. I'm not going to do karaoke, you know, but I can tell a personal story. I can bring the room down and then bring it up and I can crack a couple of clever jokes every now and then. And I remember to use my body language. So I just ask, all right, I get energy, big motion, big smile. I can do that for a period of time, but I have to do it my way. That's great. I, I think that's a really important message for people to hear. You have to do it your way. Don't try and become that extroverted person. I can't do it. You just heard Jay say he can't do it either. You have to be 100% your authentic self on stage. And if that means that you're not going to do these big, boisterous hand gestures, then don't do it. But still do everything you can to master the art. Don't just think that this is the way I am now and this is the way I'm always going to have to be. I spent huge amounts of time and so is Jay becoming better and better at, at the art of public speaking because you're always going to be able to perfect it. And for me, I know, well, Australians speak quickly, but when I'm nervous and I'm on stage, I speak crazy quick. So for me, it was about learning just to, just to slow down. I mean, did, did you find that, Jay? For a Southerner, right, all of my family already thought I was from the North because I, especially when I'm in my zone, I can start talking fast. But I was told to use silence. I mean, I've had a lot of great people that I trust. Don Hobbs, a mutual friend, he's done a lot of stage appearances. They just, I asked for their advice. Because I know if I'm working on things, I'm getting better. And then I, what, I, what I'm most kind of afraid of is not even the performance. It's that feeling that I don't know if I bombed or not after. Like I can second guess every single thing I did. And, yeah. you know, so just interacting with people, knowing that I'm working on it. And I often will let people know, you know, in some, try to find some way to let them know that like, hey, I'm not as comfortable up here as you think I am. I don't want to apologize for it. But people will come up and go, what do you mean you're an introvert? You just spoke to all these people and said, you know, you can do what you practice. And so I've practiced. I think that's the best piece of advice that any introvert can hear is just practice. It's, an, it's not an art form that you either have or you don't. It's a skill that can be learned and mastered. And so 
Jay, I'm going to ask you to come back for a second episode where we're going to talk about some of the introverted advantages you have. But for those people listening that are, that are getting a lot of great value out of this, please make sure you subscribe to the Introverts Edge to make sure that you get notified when there's some great content and some new content that's out for you. And also post a review to help us get up those charts and, and make sure that more introverts get access to this content. But if you're looking for episode two, make sure you go to the introvertsedge.com forward slash J. And I look forward to seeing you there. Thanks for joining us and I'll see you next time. Cheers. I'm on a mission to empower introverts to be proud of who we are. Introverts have had to deal with the stigma that we just can't be as successful in business or in sales as our extroverted counterparts. We're different and we need to embrace that. I instinctively shied away from sales. I didn't want to be a salesperson. My closing ratio has gone from 15% up to close to 80%. We nearly quadrupled the number of meetings set with clients. Your book was a great revelation to me about me. I've been fortunate to receive some endorsements from some exceptional introverts. They've shared with me how much they resonated with the stories of these real people and how they transformed to being sales masters. It talks about the things that make an introvert successful. Every book was written for extroverts and there needed to be something for us. Get your copy of The Introvert's Edge today.